Welcome everyone, I'm Alexis Christophorus and this event is a co-production of Yahoo Finance and the Bipartisan Policy Center. Our subject today is President Biden's budget and what's on Congress's plate when it comes to economic policy. We have got a great lineup for you over the next hour, including Senators Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania and Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. They're gonna be coming up shortly, but first, I wanna hand things over to the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, Jason Grumet, for some opening remarks. Good morning, Jason. Good morning, Alexis, and uh, always a pleasure to be here with uh, you at Yahoo Finance, and it's a really busy day. You know, I think that I'm most interested in this conversation because we're at a really critical inflection point. You know, we are moving, thank goodness, from emergency to recovery. And the question that I'm interested in talking about is, you know, what does the nation do about this, right? The Congress with leadership from folks like Senators Toomey and Van Hollen passed some remarkable, actual bipartisan legislation that started a whole host of new initiatives. Some of them might be evergreen. You know, paid sick leave is something, and I think child tax credits, there's a desire to maybe move some of those forwards. Some of them are maybe overstaying their welcome, like the unemployment insurance benefits that people are concerned is depressing labor participation. And I think it's all under this umbrella of you know, the Biden administration having about a $6 trillion ambition for more. And you know, the Bipartisan Policy Center's spidey senses, there might be about a one and a half, $2 trillion capacity. So there's a lot of challenges around prioritization. And so in the spirit of the fierce urgency of pragmatism, which is our tagline. Uh, really delighted to be here with you and uh, Senator Toomey. All right, well, thanks a lot, Jason. We are honored to bring in Senator Pat Toomey now into our conversation, lots to get to here. Of course, Toomey has represented Pennsylvania in the U.S. Senate since 2011, and he is currently the ranking member on the Senate Banking Committee. He also sits on the Senate Finance as well as the Senate Budget Committee, which is particularly relevant for our conversation today. And Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with some big uh, economic issues that are front and center right now for Congress. The Biden-Harris administration released its fiscal year 2022 budget a few weeks ago. I know that uh, you take issue with many of the proposals there, but are there provisions that you could support? Are there starting points there for bipartisan collaboration? Well, I think we, we need to look at the big picture here and fundamentally and structurally, the Biden administration is really attempting to make some pretty transformative changes. And what I'm talking about is a very dramatic increase in the size and the scope of the federal government in its role in our economy and its role in people's lives. Uh, you, you look at their spending level, which in you know recent decades has averaged something like 21% of GDP. They want to take it up to 25% of GDP. That's a very big structural increase. And much of it is, is, is about um, just the government paying for services for the middle class, making the middle class dependent on government for whether it's child tax credits, or daycare uh, credits, expanding the Affordable Care Act to make more middle income people uh, eligible for it, paid family leave, free college. Uh, you know, it's, it's this whole raft of programs where the government is saying, hey, don't worry, you're not responsible for these things. We'll take care of them and we'll make a rich guy pay for it. Don't worry, you won't have to pay for it either. Um, this is new, this is different, and it's very problematic for those of us who believe in a limited role of government, a role for the government as a safety net, but not this massive redistribution of wealth. So fundamentally, the Biden budget goes very much in the wrong direction in my view. I would also, I think it's really also important to, to remind everyone before the pandemic hit, that's not decades ago, that's just like a year and a half ago, we had the best economy in 50 years. In the wake of the tax reform that we did and the regulatory relief that we provided, we had very strong economic growth, we had record low unemployment, we had all-time record low unemployment for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, many other subsets of our country's population, we had wages growing and they were growing fastest for the lowest income Americans. So we were narrowing the income gap. This really, it's the best economy of my lifetime. I would think we would wanna get back to the best economy in say 50 or 60 years. And the Biden administration takes us in the opposite direction. So um, there, there's, that's a, there's a very big gap uh, uh, between uh, our worldviews. 
So, Senator, I think that's a really good frame for what I know is going to be the challenge around what the administration's called, you know, the care economy. Right. But let's go to the place where there's a little more possibility. You know, I think okay. infrastructure, physical infrastructure investment, it's the best idea that hasn't happened in a decade. Um, you know, the Senate now gang of 10, right? If you want to work together, you have to have a gang, right? It's tough yeah, business. Yeah. But so the gang of 10, they've said they've come out with a deal. To me, it looks more like kind of a, a framework. But the, the framework, as I understand it, is basically to roughly double investment in physical infrastructure, about a trillion dollars of spending over five years. It seems like it's essentially surface transportation plus broadband and maybe a little more. Um, just, you know, what are you, what's your thought? Is that a direction that you think you could be supportive of? And then maybe we'll drill down a little bit. Yeah. So I'm, I'm open to that and I'm in the process of evaluating it. You know, there's a, a lot of details are still missing and that, that's okay. That we'll, we can get to that. Um, but um, in principle, I have not rejected this out of hand. And the reason is because I think it might be compatible with three fundamental principles that I think we should be um, following in a infrastructure bill. First, something you alluded to, it should be infrastructure. And we know, you know, infrastructure is not actually childcare, right? That is a different thing. That's not, that it's not an important conversation, but it is a different conversation. So I want to focus on the platforms and systems that we use to move people and goods and services throughout our economy, roads and bridges and highways and waterways and airports and those sorts of things. So that's number one, real physical infrastructure. And I think that for the most part, that's what this bipartisan group has focused on. Number two, we should not be undoing the tax reform that helped us get to the best economy of my lifetime. And to their credit, this bipartisan group has not proposed undoing that tax reform. And then finally, I've, and I think this is important, and this is one that I, I've got to really um, evaluate, but I believe, I know that there are many hundreds of billions of dollars of money that was approved over the course of the last year or so in the context of the COVID pandemic and the, and the economic lockdowns, it was approved, but it hasn't been spent. We know, for instance, that most states, the vast majority of states, in fact, are absolutely awash with cash. They ended up with a record amount of tax revenue collected in 2020, and then they got hundreds of billions of dollars from the federal government on top of that without really having a lot of extraordinary expenses. So my point is the best way to pay for this big plus up in infrastructure that is contemplated is to repurpose this money, to take this money that we thought might be necessary for COVID or for to, to drive an economic recovery, clearly was not, won't otherwise be spent for years. Let's use that now for something on which we all agree, and that would be infrastructure. So let me ask you a follow up and I'll kick it back to Alexis. I think, you know, you're speaking about this transition from kind of emergency to recovery. And we will put the question to Senator Van Hollen about whether some of those resources could be repurposed for the recovery moment. I want to come back to something you said at the beginning, which is what is infrastructure? Right. Everyone's been putting whatever they want after the word infrastructure. And I think we know that you kind of know it when you see it. The issue that seems like it's at odds right now is whether clean energy comes into the, the physical aspects of things like you know, transmission and the opportunity to create, you know, electrification infrastructure. The argument right now, as I hear it, is the, you know, folks, progressives are saying there's got to be a climate infrastructure piece to this. It's not going to be a carbon tax. It's not going to be a regulation. But would you and do you think Republicans would be willing to make more investments in energy infrastructure to kind of create the foundation for that long term decarbonization? Could that find its way into your definition of scope? Um, you know, I, I'm. I, I try not to to say what I could never support, right? Um, but but I would point out that there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure spending happening in the private sector in this space, and there's no lack of funding available. So you know when in in uh, Pennsylvania and uh, up and down the Atlantic Seaboard, Wawa is an enormously popular uh, company. Uh, in Western Pennsylvania, it's Sheets. But they do a fabulous job providing a convenience store, basically food and gas pumping. And guess what? Their new facilities, the vast majority of them also have electric charging stations. They don't need the government to give them the money to do that. They're just doing that. Um, that's just an example. There are many like it. But uh, I, I think that we don't need to replace 
uh, the funding that's available in the, for the private sector. Uh, it's a little more difficult uh, to get the private sector to uh, you know, resurface an existing road where uh, you don't have a toll. You don't have any mechanism for the private invest in, investment to be recaptured. Um, so I get the federal role in those kinds of uh, shared infrastructure platforms. But a lot of what our Democratic colleagues want to do is just use federal money that will just inevitably replace what would otherwise be spent by the private sector. Senator, I'd like to turn our attention for a moment to the rising number of ransomware attacks that we have seen hit uh, some critical American businesses this year, including the nation's largest meat processor and that major East Coast uh, oil pipeline. Should the federal government be mandating security standards for the private sector, since it seems like voluntary standards now in place don't seem to be getting the job done and stopping these attacks? Um, well, I think that would be uh, that'd be a tricky thing to do, and I'm not sure the federal government knows exactly what to mandate and how it would differ from sector to sector. So right now, for instance, the financial services sector spends a massive, massive amounts of money and they repel or, or manage to defeat thousands, I don't know, maybe it's millions of uh, cyber attacks every single day. It's like continuous. Um, they've gotten extremely good at it. And one of the things that we can do is to make sure that they are able to share best practices among themselves, share information about where these attacks are coming from. But I'm not sure that we would know exactly what to require, frankly. And I'm not sure that what they do is the right approach for, say, the power grid, is the right approach for pipeline companies and, and all the others that, that we require. I will say I think this is a serious foreign policy challenge because we know that there are foreign governments that if they're not directly sponsoring these attacks, they're certainly tolerating the criminals in their countries who are conducting these attacks. And so this does require a government response, but um, I, would, I would go very cautiously in, the direct, in, in any direction that would mandate specific uh, approaches. Senator, if I can uh, jump back in with uh, one more question. We're focused on infrastructure, the, you know, crowding out a lot of uh, government attention, but other things are common, right? We have a debt ceiling. Our staff believes that, you know, it's going to probably be around October 1st, right around the beginning of the budget when the Congress is going to be forced to address the debt limit. Are we looking at another end of the year shutdown crisis or will the kind of debt ceiling detente of the last couple of years help you find a way forward? Yeah, so, you know, there's not a lot of appetite to have the fight that we have had in previous years. But by the way, the fight in previous years has often resulted in making some progress dealing with our structural fiscal imbalance. So, for instance, as you know, um, in 2011, it was a fight over the debt ceiling between Republicans in Congress and President Obama that led to the Budget Control Act. Now, you may not like the Budget Control Act or you may love it, but the fact is it imposed a discipline on discretionary spending when the Super Committee failed to reach an agreement on mandatory spending. And it actually curbed spending for a while. And it came about because there was a fight over the debt ceiling. There were budget agreements under the first Bush administration, under the Clinton administration, that also arose in the context of a debt ceiling uh, increase. So uh, look, I think we have a serious structural imbalance. The Biden administration is proposing a budget that would make it much worse. I think there are actually limits to how much debt we can carry. We're already over 100% of GDP in terms of publicly held debt. And, you know, we've been lulled into a false sense of complacency by ultra low interest rates. When interest rates are basically zero, yeah, it's pretty cheap to carry a massive mountain of debt. I don't think interest rates are going to be zero forever. And if interest rates normalize to anything like what we were accustomed to in over most of my life, then we've already got a huge problem just servicing all of that debt. So I think it's really important that we address these structural issues and doing it in the context of the debt ceiling increase would, would make sense to me. That's worked before. Having said that, 
I'm not sure there's going to be bipartisan support for taking on that challenge. And the most likely outcome, honestly, is that this can gets kicked down the road. Senator, uh, I want to switch gears for a moment and talk a little cryptocurrency. It's something we, we've spent a lot of time talking about at Yahoo Finance lately. And I know that recently you came out against proposed legislation around cryptocurrencies. You wrote in a letter to Treasury Secretary Yellen that it would prove to be a, a heavy burden on these cryptocurrency firms. And you said it may not actually combat criminal activity. Do you believe that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies do need to be regulated? And if so, what might that look like? Yeah, so that's a great question and it's an important one. And I think many of us, myself included, are still wrestling with this. My specific criticism wasn't about legislation. It was a proposed rulemaking by FinCEN. And my concern about the rulemaking is, as, as proposed, as I understand it, it puts more onerous reporting requirements on cryptocurrencies than it does on cash. And cash is anonymous and cash is used for illicit purposes every day. We know that. Um, and so it's not clear to me that we should have a regime that's more onerous on these uh, cryptocurrencies than what we have on the fiat currency. And so that was that was what I was pushing back on. Um, intuitively, and I'm, I'm still really trying to explore this and understand this, but intuitively it seems to me uh, comparable uh, kinds of controls on, for instance, anti-money laundering requirements, uh, that sort of thing probably makes some sense. Um, but, but I want to tread cautiously because I think the underlying technology here of a distributed ledger is really, really important, very innovative, and is going to lead to really probably a revolution in financial services generally and all kinds of services that require record keeping. I don't want to stifle that innovation. Um, so I want to make sure we strike a good balance between um, minimizing the opportunity for criminality, which there is certainly some, um, while at the same time maximizing the opportunity for the kind of innovation that will inevitably lead to new and better products and services. Well, we're all going to be watching to see what comes down the pike for, uh, for cryptocurrencies for sure. Uh, Senator Pat Toomey, thanks so much for, for being with us. We appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. All right, now uh, from the other side of the aisle, we're joined by Senator Chris Van Hollen. Van Hollen uh, represents Maryland. He's also a member of the Senate Banking and Budget Committees. And Senator, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Well, it's great to be with both of you this morning. I want to start with uh, seemingly the talk of the town, which is infrastructure. We got now this bipartisan proposal from the so-called Gang of Ten that sort of falls somewhere in between the GOP plan and President Biden's plan. What in that proposal can you get behind? Do you think that has the best chance of actually passing? Well, a couple things. First, I have not seen uh, the details or the fine print on that plan. And as of last night, it was still in flux. Uh, and so obviously I wanna take a, a close look at it. Uh, this is what I would refer to as the very, very skinny uh, infrastructure uh, bill. Uh, and I, I think many of us recognize, and of course, President Biden does, because he put forward the American Jobs Plan, the American Families Plan, that our requirements, our national requirements when it comes to modernizing our infrastructure go beyond this bipartisan proposal. So if this were to move forward, I can say that uh, there, are, there are many of us uh, that want assurances uh, at least from 50 Senate Democrats, uh, that they will join with us uh, in passing a reconciliation measure uh, to address the unmet needs, uh, those portions of our infrastructure modernization plan that are not addressed in the bipartisan proposal, and those elements of President Biden's American Families Plan that, of course, are nowhere to be found uh, in this uh, proposal. Let me jump on that because I think the dynamic that you're describing between you know the kind of regular order process and reconciliation very complicated. It depends a lot on your kind of compared to what reference point. When we look at the kind of physical infrastructure, traditional core, whatever adjective you want in the administration's plan, there is about a trillion, a little over a trillion dollars of that physical infrastructure. Help me understand why moving forward with that proposal in some people's minds kind of undermines 
the opportunity around reconciliation? Why isn't it, hey, let's get what we can get, and then we're going to go have a big argument about the other $5 trillion? Well, I didn't say it undermines it, but I did indicate that uh, those senators who agree uh, that uh, this skinny you know, version of the infrastructure bill yeah. does not meet uh, the, the Biden plan. I mean, you mentioned his sort of traditional infrastructure components, but there, as you well know, there are other parts of his American jobs plan that don't fall in that category. Uh, we would just want assurances that um, at least the 50, all 50 Senate Democrats uh, support moving forward with a more ambitious plan. And as you well know, reconciliation is a tool. It's within the rules of the Senate. Um, and whether it's on climate change matters, uh, whether it's on the issue of home health care that President Biden has put forward, or whether it's the other issues related to the American Families Plan, uh, those are all things that uh, we think are going to have to be done through reconciliation. Um, and we just want an agreement uh, that all of this uh, will ultimately uh, come together and pass. Understood. So let me ask, you know, the hardest question we have is paying for things. Um, Senator Toomey made the argument that, you know, as we make this kind of transition, as I described it, from kind of emergency to recovery, there are probably some resources on the table, some things that Congress did at a moment of very effective muscular response to crisis. You know, for example, the unemployment insurance plus up that a lot of governors are now saying they're going to kind of end before the statutory September deadline. You know, Senator Toomey's arguing that we should be able to reprogram a lot of those resources towards now the next step of recovery. How do you think about that? I mean, the words clawback conjure a lot of negative imagination, but is there some opportunity to now kind of optimize some of these resources as the economy recovers, as the vaccine takes hold? So I heard uh, Senator Toomey primarily mention the funds that have gone to state and local governments. Um, and I can tell you in talking to people like the mayor of uh, Baltimore City, um, they have very specific plans and needs uh, for the funds that we provided as part of the American uh, Rescue uh, Plan for the city. And of course, uh, there are some parameters to those funds, uh, but they're pretty flexible uh, overall. It's not specifically directed, for example, to infrastructure use. So I, I do not support the idea of clawing back those funds, which is what it would be, uh, and then restricting uh, the use of those funds to one purpose when the needs of places like Baltimore City um, are very varied and very different. And, you know, I think all of us agree that one size does not fit all uh, around the country. Uh, and that's exactly why we provided uh, cities like Baltimore and other municipalities with that kind of uh, flexibility. The, the UI funds, look, I, I, I think it's a mistake for many of those governors to terminate uh, the UI uh, early, but that's that's a separate discussion. Um, we'll take a look at, you know, what, what funds are left over. Uh, but just to your point on making sure things are paid for, because I, I, I want to emphasize one thing. I, I heard my friend Senator Toomey, and I, we work together on lots of issues like foreign policy and national security. But I, I do remember uh, during the Trump administration, uh, they passed a, a tax cut that disproportionately went to the very wealthy and to big corporations that was totally unpaid for. Um, and if you look at the four years of the Trump administration, overall, actually, GDP uh, was pretty much on the trajectory of the Obama administration. So were real wages. The one thing that went up uh, was the deficit. Contrast that to the, the Biden plans. I mean, you may not like, someone may not like the, the components of the American Jobs Plan or the American Families Plan, but he does put on the table pay-fors uh, to address that um, over the 15-year period. Um, and uh, I would welcome uh, those of Republican colleagues who say they're, you know, fiscal conservatives uh, to uh, look back at what they did with the, with the tax cuts. Um, and actually, you know, if they believe in paying for things, look at, let's, let's discuss Biden's proposals. Senator, I, I want to get your take on the string of ransomware attacks that have hit some critical American businesses uh, this year. We asked Senator Toomey the same question, and he seemed to think it, it, it's not the job of the federal government to mandate security standards for the private sector. But 
you know, if you look at the at the breadth and depth of these attacks, it doesn't seem like the private sector and their voluntary standards are actually getting the job done and protecting this critical infrastructure. So what do you think the answer is and what role should the federal government play? Well, I do think this is something we should look at. Uh, you may recall, we actually had uh, this debate many, many years ago. I think it was Senator Lieberman who proposed uh, legislation to establish uh, national standards uh, for things like uh, cybersecurity. Uh, clearly, we have lots of vulnerabilities in the system. Um, we are currently trying to address that by sort of better coordination uh, between the private sector and uh, the public sector. Uh, my state of Maryland is home uh, to the U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, and, you know, when Cyber Command gets an indication of um, attacks on U.S. infrastructure, um, I think the, the public sector, whether it's Homeland Security or whoever it may be, uh, tries to alert the private sector and vice versa. But I do think whether it's set required national standards or a better agreed understanding of um, what uh, protections, uh, you know, private industry needs to take, uh, we need to move forward. Because, of course, when you're talking about infrastructure like the Colonial Pipeline, like um, our electric grid, uh, those obviously intersect with a huge uh, public interest. Um, I would also say with respect to, you know, private companies, uh, I have been pushing for them to require, to, to require disclosure uh, to the public and to their shareholders um, when, they're, uh, when they've been um, under attack. Um, we've had cases in the past uh, where, you know, we, we've also had identity theft, for example, people breaking into uh, the database of, of companies, uh, and that doesn't get uh, quickly enough reported to the, to the public. Senator, let me uh, jump back in, and we're, we're bouncing around because it's a target-rich environment for big, exciting problems. I want to ask you about housing policy. Um, a tremendous amount of challenges prior to the pandemic with affordability and homelessness. I think as an emergency stopgap, you know, the Senate passed an eviction on moratoria. I'm sorry, a moratoria on evictions, which I believe lapses at the end of this month. You and Senator Young introduced legislation to significantly increase, I think, by about 500,000, the number of vouchers that are available for low-income folks, particularly with kids, have access to rental facility, rental apartments. How is that conversation moving forward? Do you feel like that has the ability to possibly become part of the poor infrastructure debate, right? These are houses built with cement and brick and steel. Does this flow forward into what you think is reconciliation. Just a little bit of your sense about, are, are we about to face a tsunami of homelessness that we are not prepared for? Well, I think we're at risk for that. As you said, the you know, current uh, eviction moratorium comes to an end uh, at the end of this month. Uh, Congress did uh, provide uh, rental assistance funds to try to help those tenants who have gotten way behind on their rental payments, uh, the opportunity to have them paid. Uh, there's still a, a, a lot of issues uh, to be sorted out, making sure that works. Uh, but even with those funds, uh, yes, uh, there is a, a risk of eviction as people have these balloon payments that may come due. So I do think we need to address that potential emergency. But to your question on the longer term, and I, Senator Todd Young of Indiana and I have introduced bipartisan legislation to do exactly what you said. Uh, which is to provide lower income families uh, with a voucher uh, that would allow them and their kids uh, to move to areas of higher opportunity. All the data shows this is a really effective way uh, to help uh, lift people out of poverty, provide more opportunity. And I do hope, in fact, I'm pushing very hard uh, to have that included um, as part of the infrastructure plan, uh, which will also include provisions to increase the supply of housing. Uh, but I think it also needs to include uh, additional uh, vouchers um, in order to help those most in need. I think I have uh, one more one more question for you and then I hand it back to Alexis. And I can't help but come back to the paying for conversation one more time, because I think, look, you know, the trend lines are not great, right? I think Senator Toomey made the argument that we're expanding the spend side to a historically unusual level. You've made the point that the revenue side since the 2017 tax reform has been below historic levels. So we see where that's going. 
at the same time, we have this idea that, you know, we shouldn't impose any taxes on people earning less than $400,000 a year. That the, you know, administration has come up with. And you know, I, I understand the premise. The idea that the administration won't contemplate indexing the gas tax to inflation, that that is somehow an affront to the middle class, concerns me if we think about this, you know, just the gulf here between spending and revenue. You know, I think progressives want to talk about a carbon tax. Well, that's not, I mean, if we won't index the gas tax to inflation, carbon tax isn't a serious discussion. So how, how do you reconcile, uh, the, you know, the focus on trying to impose, you know, additional taxes on that 1% with the reality that there's a lot of us left in the 99% who are going to have to be part of the solution? How do we understand that tension? So just really briefly with respect to the carbon tax, and I've introduced um, for years now a cap and dividend bill, which would actually dividend the proceeds of uh, what would be effectively a price on carbon uh, to every uh, American so that lower income uh, Americans would not uh, feel the you know cost uh, impact of uh, a carbon uh, fee. So look, what, what President Biden is saying is pretty clear is let's look at our current tax code um, and fix what we've got in front of us. It's clearly already broken in a couple ways. One, we know from the IRS commissioner, and this of course is the IRS commissioner uh, that was appointed by Donald Trump, uh, that about $700 billion um, of taxes due over 10 years uh, could be collected with a little more enforcement from people who already owe their taxes. Uh, we also saw revealed the other day that some of the wealthiest people in the country are paying zero income taxes. We also know that corporations that got a, a, a great windfall uh, from the Republican tax cut and used a lot of those funds on tax buybacks uh, also park a lot of their uh, profits in tax havens overseas. So this is why President Biden has proposed increasing the corporate tax, establishing a minimum uh, corporate tax, closing tax loopholes. Those are the things we need to do uh, before we talk about raising, you know, taxes on, on other Americans. And I think the president is right about that. Senator, I know that the Senate recently passed that U.S. Innovation and Competition Act uh, to boost American R&D and keep us more competitive globally, especially as it relates to China. And that legislation I know is now awaiting action in the House. The bill initially had some pretty strong bipartisan support, but I know that you eventually voted against it. What aspects of that legislation do you oppose? Well, I'm sorry you've got misinformation. I, I voted for it. I was a strong proponent of the bill. In fact, uh, a lot of measures that I proposed um, in legislation, bipartisan efforts are included in that package, uh, in, including um, you know legislation to give uh, the federal government uh, the ability to impose sanctions against companies that mostly with the help of their governments, and thinking primarily China here, uh, engage in serial theft of, of U.S. Uh, technology. And um, so that's another provision. Senator Blunt and I uh, establish a a process by which the National Academies of uh, Science and Engineering will give us regular updates about where we need to be concentrating U.S. R&D investment. Uh, we know many of those areas where we've got to be more competitive, AI, quantum computing, a clean energy, battery storage. I mean, there's a whole range of things. I think this is a very important bill uh, for three reasons. We need to make this investment in cutting edge technologies. Number two, on the foreign policy side, um, we need to have more tools uh, to address things we're seeing like China's Belt and Road Program where they're using concentrated economic power to try to export their authoritarian uh, model and you know, clamp down on freedom of the press and freedom of expression. So no, I thought this was a very important bill and enthusiastically uh, supported it. All right, we're gonna leave it there. Senator Van Hollen of Maryland, Thanks so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thanks. I want to turn now uh, to a panel that we've gathered to talk through all that we just heard. We have got Wendy Edelberg. She is the director of the Hamilton Project and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Before that, she was chief economist at the Congressional Budget Office. 
Also, Gordon Gray is currently the Director of Fiscal Policy at the American Action Forum. And before that, he was a Senior Policy Advisor to Senator Rob Portman and the Deputy Director of Domestic and Economic Policy for Senator John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign. I want to thank you both uh, for joining Jason and myself today. Wendy, I'm going to start with you. And there is this central question uh, for U.S. growth right now, and that is to what extent will inflation be transient or temporary, something Fed Chair Powell uh, continues to say is going to be the case. There are concerns it's going to hinder our recovery efforts by overheating the economy. To what degree do you think the Fed needs to act now and start pulling back and tapering that bond that bond buying um, program and also starting to raise interest rates? Because some are fearful here that the Fed is going to fall behind the curve and inflation will get away from it. So we are most definitely in for overheating. I think that that cake is baked. Uh, the question is, how can we manage the overheating? So overheating on its own is not, is not necessarily a terrible thing. There are lots of positive side effects of overheating, but we do need to make sure that we manage the slowdown that comes on the other side. So what I think the Fed should be doing now, along with other policymakers, is strongly signaling to everyone to set expectations that this is temporary. This is a temporary surge in economic activity, and that will help to manage inflation expectations but I think even more importantly, it will help to make sure that households and businesses don't make permanent decisions in response to this temporary activity. Let me uh, let me jump in and welcome Wendy, you and Gordon, and um, ask Gordon to jump in on the same question, right? I mean, my, you know, my frame for this discussion is this transition from emergency to recovery. It's like you know landing uh, you know, on an aircraft carrier at night in a storm, right? And so I think. Interested in your thoughts in terms of what Wendy just responded to about that pivotal wave from inflation. Maybe we'll also bring in this labor market conversation about are we creating the right incentives for people to get back into the workforce. But you know, let's talk about this really remarkable moment in economic policy. Great, and uh, appreciate the question, and, and thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate the discussion. Uh, and I think you characterize sort of this moment in, in time uh, correctly, which is very much, it's going to be a delicate handoff. And I think we should probably all as as policy observers and, and also I think policy makers uh, should probably have a little humility uh, about sort of their ability to micromanage this transition. And I think that at least with uh, with respect to the first issue that we, we were talking about with, with inflation, um, you know, there's going to have to be some room to, uh, for some uh, for some surprises, and you know, I'm anxious to see what the the Fed has to say today, based on some of the more recent um, uh, inflation data. Um, but you know, I think you know, uh, I think I wouldn't draw a straight line, for example, to some of the more recent upside surprises on inflation to you know runaway inflation of the the 1970s. We're not there yet, and so I think you know, there's definitely some room to just um, you know, everybody needs to take a breath recognize that we're in a bit of a delicate uh, transition um, right now from a uh, historic economic and sort of, um, uh, event with respect to the pandemic and then moving into uh, a recovery. And, and we're going to get some things right. We're going to get some things wrong. Um, and it's going to be hard to say, you know, pull all of these levers at exactly the right time to the exact uh, right degree to exactly manage this transition. We're just not, it's not going to happen. And so, you know, some things are going to, we're going to get a few things right. And we're going to get a few things wrong along the way. And I think we just need to recognize that. I think that'll be important. Okay, so in terms well, of delicate of that, handoff, go ahead, Alexis. I was going to say part of that delicate transition puzzle is taxes, right? And we, we talked, uh, with the, with the senators about this, Jason, that, you know, President Biden has pledged that no American making less than $400,000 a year would face higher taxes under his administration. But we already face large deficits and plans for tremendous amounts, record amounts of spending on things like infrastructure. So, Wendy, do you think we can realistically stick to President Biden's pledge to not raise taxes on a, on a bunch of Americans, actually the majority of Americans who do make less than $400,000? As a card-carrying economist, I could never sign off on or endorse an arbitrary cutoff, uh, like not raising taxes on anybody who makes less than $400,000 a year. That said, I think we can and should do more to make our tax system more progressive. But 
even within this, this general framework of trying to keep tax increases um, uh, you know, sequestered to a certain part of the income distribution, the Biden administration's proposals raise hundreds of billions of dollars and perhaps even as much as $2 trillion over the next 15 years. So it certainly can be done. Let me let me get uh, Gordon into this the same question. You know, I think when when we think about infrastructure, who benefits, right? You know, all Americans, if it's done well, benefit. There's always been this history of a user fee approach, and then you know, corporations and competitiveness benefit. And so the idea of having the corporations pick up some of the tab makes sense. You know, Gordon, you know, as a conservative. Um, you know, is the Biden administration making a mistake with the, you know, kind of almost read my lips pledge on anything under four hundred thousand dollars? I mean, is it you know, can you actually absent? And this is obviously I'm leading the witness. Can you absent ninety nine percent of the public from the long term interests of the uh, fiscal situation? You know, he, here's the problem with with pledges like that. Um, and it's uh, that, yeah, uh, uh, an administration can absolutely impose this pledge and go through their entire administration without imposing taxes on a given um, you know, segment of the population. The problem is then it's the next administration's problem to, you know, to pay for those, those legacy costs. And that's, that's been the tradition of successive administrations over time. And that's why we're, um, you know, we're standing uh, with a debt of you know, 100% of GDP and that is going up under the, under the CBO baseline. And it's going up even faster under uh, the president's budget. And it's because everybody seems to do this. Everybody has their own priorities and their pledges, and none of it involves paying for stuff. So um, that's that's my biggest objection uh, to this, which is um, it, the Biden administration is proposing significant taxes. Um, you know, given the scope and scale of our budgetary challenge, you know, as a conservative, I, I recognize that there's no, you know, sort of grand bargain or big solution to the federal deficit that probably won't involve uh, revenues. Problem is, uh, you know, the president's budget is raising significant amount of taxes and then spending it all. Um, you know, if these are supposed to be the easy taxes to raise, you know, um, raising taxes on the rich and on corporations and all the all the taxes that that uh, progressives like like to campaign on and seem to resonate um, uh, politically, they're spending more than than they're raising. So we haven't made a dent to the deficit uh, under this under this budget. Um, in fact, it doesn't go anywhere near uh, as far in terms of just fiscal consolidation that we need. This is a president's budget that leaves the debt higher uh, than than when it began. And so that's that's my, fundamentally my problem is that we're not paying for any of this stuff. So uh, Gordon, while you have this screen, I'd love uh, Wendy to reflect on this also because it's a pretty big idea. You know, this notion of a kind of international minimum tax of 15% as well as uh, kind of overarching requirement to make sure some of the big tech companies are paying in. This was an idea that, you know, Secretary Yellen advanced. The G7 seems to at least have notionally embraced it. So, Wendy, I mean, is this a big deal? Is this going to work? Is this matter? Better international corporate, better international cooperation on the, on the corporate tax system is a, is a good thing. It's very sensible. And if you're thinking about, if you're worried about where corporations might um, might might put themselves, um, which countries they might might put their headquarters in. I think starting with coordination among the G7 also makes a lot of sense. So I think that there is money to be raised here. Um, I think that this absolutely goes in the right direction, and it doesn't worry me at all about our competitiveness. Gordon, you want to comment on that, and then I'll turn it over to Alexis. I, you know, I. I probably I have more concerns uh, than, than Wendy does about the outlook. Right, you know, right now um, it remains to be seen as to to what degree there's there's consensus among uh, the G20 and then more broadly in the inclusive framework. I think, um, you know, the it's 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 not obvious to me, for example, that this would necessarily raise at least the the inclusive framework process would would raise revenues in the United States. Rather, it would seed some some of the U.S. tax base um, overseas. You know, a global minimum tax paired with the corporate taxes that the, the Biden administration is is proposing, uh, th then that would be a revenue positive uh, event for the United States. But um, the corporate tax proposal that the Biden administration is proposing kind of don't really work as well without global agreement. So, um, you know, those two kind of have to ride together and it, it remains to be seen whether or not that's achievable.
I want to get your thoughts, both of you, um, Wendy and Gordon, on the labor market, because we're seeing that the economy continues to add hundreds of thousands of jobs. We have the unemployment rate now below 6%. All of this points to a strengthening labor market. But at the same time, we keep hearing from businesses, large and small, saying they just can't find the workers. There is a serious labor shortage right now, uh, which could, in fact, jeopardize our economic recovery. How do you think we should best do do this in terms of getting people wanting to go back to work. We know that a number of states have now said no to that extra $300 in unemployment benefits, thinking that might incentivize folks to go back. But do you think that's going to work? And, and what are some other ways that we can get people back on the job? For the next few months, we have to start seeing bigger numbers in, empl in employment gains uh, in order to really close the employment shortfall. Uh, but But I think rather than this, thinking of this specifically as a labor labor supply shortage i think we should focus on the fact that there is an enormous amount of churn in the labor market there are hundreds of thousands of people who are getting jobs every month there are also hundreds of thousands of people who are leaving their jobs every month so i do think that the ui benefits the expanded and 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 um and increased ui benefits are certainly one of the reasons that people are taking longer to find good matches but there are other reasons as well. I mean, the quit rate is is at an all time high. So the 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 fraction of people uh, with jobs who who are quitting those jobs and presumably looking for better matches. Um, the number of people who are leaving employment every month that is probably holding down the net job gain each month by by maybe a half million people. So this is going to take a few months, I believe, to work its way through as we see these massive shifts in demand from, from one sector to another sector. We see people who probably took jobs during the pandemic that always were meant to be temporary jobs and now they're leaving those jobs and looking for more permanent matches. This is chaotic and, and, and I think it's gonna take a few months to work itself out. Gordon, what are your thoughts here on, on how best to handle the, the labor shortage going forward? So I think Wendy gets this exactly right, in my view, and, and it's um, it would be very easy to point to one thing and say, aha, that's it. We just uh, change this policy and everything will we'll get back to a nice orderly um, increase in, in employment. And I just don't think that's the case. I, th I think it's fair to observe that, you know, with UI benefits where you have, you know, about a third or 30 to 40 percent uh, of workers for, for whom the benefits exceed, you know, what they were making, that that will have an effect. But I also don't think that it's 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 fair or, or wise to say that uh, well that that's the single biggest reason that we're not seeing employment uh, growth that we would like to see. As Wendy said, you know, people quitting their jobs um, is is substantially higher than I think what any of us would have expected after the the turmoil of the last year. There's just a lot of churn. Families and individuals and households have been through an awful lot in the last year. There's you know people are experiencing a lot more than just um, you know the, the expectations of their income as it relates to UI. Um, so I think it's, it's um, again, sort of speaking that we should have some humility about being able to define exactly what is going on in the labor market to, to any you know, highly precise degree. So I think there's a lot of factors at play. I think UI is one of them. I think it's significant, but it's by no means, um, if, I don't think it's, it's safe to say that it is the decisive factor here. There's a lot going on. There is a lot going on, and this discussion will be continued for sure. But for now, that, that's all the time we have. This has been a great uh, hour-long discussion today about economic policy, and I want to thank our participants. At the top of the hour, we had Senators Pat Toomey and Chris Van Hollen, and, of course, our thanks to our panelists, Wendy Edelberg of the Hamilton Project and Gordon Gray of the American Action Forum. For Jason Grumet of the Bipartisan Policy Center, I'm Alexis Christophorus of Yahoo Finance. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.